Yeah, so, I, I see we can, yeah, we can officially start. Okay. Welcoming cool. remarks. Brilliant. Because, um, yeah. A very uh, good Friday morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, delighted to welcome you on behalf of the uh, American Chamber of Commerce. Uh, this is an event uh, that many have been asking for, and we're absolutely delighted to host this event uh, this morning together with uh, OSAC. This is the Overseas Security Advisory Council. Um, and the topic is uh, on the security situation in, in, in Ukraine. And I think, you know, the current security situation in Ukraine from the perspective of doing business. So we see that um, over one year following the full-scale uh, invasion, we have 70% uh, 7 of the member companies continue to operate fully. Uh, over 80% are paying salaries. Uh, we've seen the realities that just um, over 30% have had property damaged, uh, factories damaged in different um, um, sort of uh, levels. Um, but I think, you know, we can also discuss that later. Um, and also, very sadly, we've seen 19% of the members have had uh, at least one employee that's been killed over the last um, a year. Um, today is really a, a very practical um, uh, view on the security situation from the perspective of doing business. And I'm absolutely delighted that we have with us today um, Serhi, Serhi Hrabski. Serhi Hrabski is security specialist in the World Bank Group in um, Armenia, Belarus, Moldova, Poland, and Ukraine. Um, he is the OSEC Ukraine co-chair for the private sector. He's the co-founder of the all-Ukrainian NGO Union of Participants in Peacekeeping Operations, a retired colonel of the Armed Forces of Ukraine, a military expert, and the first citizen of Ukraine to be awarded the highest medal of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization for Special Merits, uh, discovered during his service as part of the training mission in, in Iraq. So this is part of a three, um, three series um, presentations. And today we'll, we'll, we'll kick off. Um, I know there are a lot of questions uh, and I think there will be an opportunity for Q&A, but please do use the Q&A in, in the chat. Um, and I do remember that we had a not very dissimilar uh, briefing in February, 2022 literally i think it was two weeks before the full scale incursion and i think some of the advice that said he and his colleagues were giving us were extremely helpful uh and uh, it did help us uh, in terms of our contingency planning so uh, ladies and gentlemen without further ado i'm delighted to present the floor to said he hrabski said he over to you thank you thank you andy and ladies and gentlemen nice to meet you and uh, uh i would also uh, it is my honor just to uh, mention that it is the first OSAC actually event together with the American Chamber of Commerce in Ukraine after the wild, uh, wild, uh, wild scale invasion started in Ukraine over there. And uh, with this regard, uh, I also happy to mention that uh, we launched our series of uh, presentations regarding the security situation and other aspects such as uh, traveling in Ukraine. And uh, we will touch uh, somehow uh, those aspects here uh, during my presentations, but uh, I would also call you to participate actively in our presentations uh, in this presentation and the next one. And in addition, it's the last point in, uh, I assume in April, we will have a presentation regarding the training capabilities in Ukraine. I I will do my best just to invite uh, all available sources, international and national sources, just to offer uh, their capabilities uh, to organize different uh, training aspects and preparation and training programs over there. Because, you know, well, I tried from the very beginning to put everything in one uh, presentation. However, digging deeper and deeper, I found it would be technically impossible just to keep your attention during maybe three, four, maybe five hours. Uh, that is why we divided. Uh, we decided just to divide all of our uh, topics in different uh, presentations. So today, today I would like to offer you uh, some ideas, probably, and uh, probably my and uh, general points of view regarding the security situation in Ukraine. What do we have right now, and how it may impact to our further discussions, such as like a physical requirements and traveling in Ukraine, and in a broader perspective about doing business in Ukraine? Should we do something or not? Let's discuss and uh, please, please, please ask me questions. And uh, if you will feel that uh, I am 
very detailed please stop me because you know uh, as andy mentioned i'm military i like that part of my work in there well let's start let's start so what do we have right now uh first of all uh, a short agenda i hope i will be quite short right now but uh, i would like to offer you some general points about uh, what's going on what happened before and uh, how situation may develop Indeed, I'm not too smart just to provide all of uh, those aspects using only my own sources. That is why I'm happy to show you some quite useful uh, sources of information, uh, as we mentioned here. So uh, for those of you who are interested about different aspects and would like to make your own vision of the situation, I may recommend those sources. Uh, indeed, I can't get you access, and that is why I didn't put it here, access to UN reports and analytical updates from the UN, uh, UN system and uh, civil line reports. It's like uh, uh, some specific, but I will widely use it. And uh, if you will need it, please contact me. We could discuss it like uh, face by face or in person. Uh, also, uh, other open sources, as you can see here, may be helpful for you to make your determination and uh, make your decision available for further actions in Ukraine. So let's start. And uh, I will start with this quite general map offered by the Deep State uh, website. And this map show, uh, shows us uh, the general concept of operations, what actually happened in Ukraine. And uh, Andy mentioned we had a meeting before, actually two weeks before the invasion started, and uh, Andy could remember that I was absolutely confident that uh, it can't happen uh, at that time. We may assume that something could happen somewhere in April, May 2022, but I was absolutely clear, I was absolutely uh, confident that Russians will not start uh, any kind of wild-scale offens uh, offensive during the winter time. And frankly speaking, I was shocked uh, when Russian launched that absolutely uh, avant-touristic uh, operation against the Ukraine, and uh, I don't know why they, they did start it, but in my understanding, based on my military background from the very beginning, it, it was like a real aventure, as French people said sometimes. So Russians have launched that operation from different uh, directions, trying to capture at least all of Ukraine, and uh, they started with a massive airstrike. However, However, what I have to say, uh, they didn't study well, probably in military academy, because of not, like a normal airstrike must uh, consist of like at least 400 uh, missile and air attacks. Uh, in fact, we had, and it was my first call uh, at the end of the 24th of February day to my colleagues, uh, active army personnel, how many missiles and airstrikes did we have during the day? They mentioned. 186. We started from that uh, figures, and uh, at that time, I started to realize it, it from military perspective. I, I don't touch a political and other aspects. It's something. Uh, it looks like a joke because uh, that operation was not prepared uh, in detail and uh, not supply enough to conduct it against such a country as Ukraine. So as you can see in the very beginning, due to the sudden strike, Russian forces achieved quite significant results, occupying a big portion of territory of Ukraine, mainly on the left bank of the river Dnipro. Dnipro sorry. And indeed, it was clear that their main uh, aim was the uh, capital of the country, the city of Kiev, where they concentrated in Belarus a huge amount of troops. But also, I have to reiterate why I was so confident that it may not happen. Uh, Russians pass through the Chernobyl zone, which is a highly polluted zone. And uh, from the perspective of military planning, it, is, it shouldn't be a reachable zone or passable zone for any reason, but they did it. So it was additional uh, uh, aspect which uh, may stay out of our analyze at the moment. So since that time, since the time, since, since the end of uh, February, beginning of March, it was quite clear, in particular after 2nd of March, uh, that uh, Russians will not uh, achieve their aims in Ukraine. 
in a close perspective. And uh, it's allowed me to say, to state it uh, many times after the 2nd of March that Russians will, uh, will lose that game or uh, will fail. Uh, then uh, situation developed, as you can see, and I would uh, separate the general or, or overview of the last year in a separate uh, uh, periods, uh, such as uh, period of uh, sudden strike where Russians achieved a maximum of their uh, aims. However, they didn't capture even one single uh, regional center except uh, Kherson. Uh, in other cases, they surrounded the, the, but they exhausted their military capabilities trying to uh, surround those locations. Also, they tried to get to Kyiv without any success. And uh, since the end of uh, March, uh, Ukrainian forces started their counter-offensive actions. Uh, and step by step, they liberated territory in Kyiv, Chernigiv, Sume Oblast. Then there was a quite uh, significant battle in uh, Lugansk and uh, Donetsk Oblast. In particular, you remember uh, defense uh, of uh, Severodonetsk and Lysychansk. And uh, Ukrainian forces with that regard used a quite well-known uh, mobile defense uh, philosophy, if, if I would like to mention it here. Uh, philosophy trying to exhaust uh, Russian forces, uh, which are desperately attacked their positions, I mean, Ukrainian positions. And I, ha I have to say that the, uh, this practice was very and still very and very successful. And this practice uh, allowed Ukrainian uh, defense forces uh, please note, uh, I will not use like uh, armed forces, but defense forces, because of uh, Ukrainian defense forces consist not only armed forces of Ukraine, but also National Guard, State Security Service, State Border Guard Service, and other uh, military entities of Ukraine. So that is why defense forces is a most uh, acceptable definition of uh, ground forces in Ukraine. So defense forces of Ukraine uh, liberated also Kharkiv region, uh, during the summer offensive. And uh, I would like to pay attention to the south because of south and the uh, western bank of the, the river Dnieper in Herston Oblast is uh, one of the most interesting battles of this war where Ukrainian forces use like an um, exhaustive uh, strategy uh, pushing Russians uh, from the right bank of the river Dnipro and uh, destroying their um, logistical and uh, general military capabilities. And uh, at the end of uh, October, beginning of November, Russian forces withdrew from the uh, west bank of the river Dnipro in uh, Kherson Oblast. Then people ask me, why did Ukrainian forces stop there? And uh, the answer was, uh, because of Ukrainian forces uh, still have a quite limited capabilities, uh, which significantly limit their uh, efforts uh, in order to liberate further territories. And as of now, the front line stabilized on the position as we have now. Uh, it means that the, most of the territory of Lugansk Oblast, uh, big portion of territory of Donetsk Oblast, uh, main portion of uh, Zaporizhia Oblast and the West Bank uh, part of uh, Kherson Oblast is now under control of Russian Federation. And uh, preventing your question how situation will develop and why we have such a situation, I prepare as, as if, uh, another slide. And uh, it is not like a commercial, but uh, you may find that information openly from the uh, deep state map uh, source. And here you could see concentration of Russian troops right now and uh, their location around the, uh, along the front line and in, in different parts of uh, potential front line of Ukrainian uh, on the war between Ukraine and Russian Federation. So you remember many rumors uh, regarding the possible offensive actions uh, from the north of uh, uh, for, to the northern part of Ukraine, to Kiev, to Chernigiv, Sume, etc. So as you can see here, we can almost exclude any uh, forecast and any possibilities that Russian forces in a near perspective may attack uh, the city of Kiev. 
the same story with the Kharkiv and other locations. Because of, despite of mobilization, despite of concentration, the huge amount and quite impressive amount of troops, Russians are not able just to create a, a real pressure along all uh, front line in Ukraine, including Belarus. That is why our first part of presentation regarding the current security situation will be mostly concentrated on so-called Eastern Front and South Front of uh, Ukrainian-Russian war. Yes, indeed, there are some military activities um, in Belarus and uh, in other locations, but let me put it on the end of that part of presentation. So what do we have now? Uh, many of you probably read regularly reports of uh, Ukrainian uh, general staff, uh, but uh, I have to confess that uh, those reports are not, are not so uh, factual, let's say, and it is quite difficult to understand what's going on in the front line. Let's, uh, let's dig deeper in details, and uh, I beg your pardon in advance if uh, my maps, actually not my maps, but maps offered by open sources uh, would be quite detailed, but I hope I would be able to explain some detail, uh, details and the specific of each particular section of the front, active front line. I repeat, active front line. Then we will turn to situation in Belarus and to presumably in Moldova, because of, as Andy mentioned, I am also responsible for Moldova, and, and now I am in a in a permanent uh, consultation with our Moldovan counterparts, and I keep my eye carefully on the situation with Moldova. Any questions about it? Please don't do not hesitate and ask me. Well, what do we have now? Current situation, and uh, we will. Uh, advance step by step uh, from the north to south. Sorry about the quality of the map, but uh, we are not military expert experts, uh, most of us, and uh, it is a, an example how those maps may be used for you uh, for better understanding of the situation on the ground. So as you can see, despite a very uh, White, uh, uh, white announced uh, offensive uh, in, in the Lugansk Oblast. Uh, Russians did not achieve any significant results in the uh, Lugansk Oblast, and in particular in that minor portion of the Kharkiv Oblast where they tried to keep their position and advance in the direction of Kharkiv. As now you can see, can you see my arrow on the street, on the, on the map? No? Oh, okay. Let me explain. Uh, if you will uh, turn to uh, your eyes to the so-called Sloboda front, as you can read it there, uh, you could see that there is no, actually there is no real advance of Russian troops in that direction, despite of the big concentration in the zone of uh, Svatova. Russians uh, try to reach position uh, and advance to Kupiansk, as a main um, railway junction in, in that zone, and it will support them to develop their offensive actions there. Yeah, I have to mention as a general uh, comment uh, that the Russians are very rely on uh, logistical support uh, based on the railway connection. So they're quite limited with their ground movements, but they mostly rely on railways. That is why for them, uh, for them, uh, Kupiansk as a location would be a great achievement in order to develop and uh, expand their uh, uh, offensive actions to other parts of uh, Kharkiv Oblast. But fact is the same. They did not advance there. Why? Let's move uh, closer to the situation near Kremina and uh, Svatova, which is on the second map here named Siversky, Donetsk Front. So as you can see there, um, after quite effective... Sir, he, sir, he yeah. may, may, maybe do use the arrow, because I think we may have seen it. Uh, can you use the arrow on the screen? It'll help us. Can you see my arrow? Yes, yes, yes. Ah, Maules, Maules. Uh, it make my life much easier. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Well, uh, dear colleagues, as you can see, uh, at the end of uh, November, Ukrainian forces advanced quite closer to Kremina. Then uh, counteroffensive action from Russian uh, actions from the Russian st uh, side started, and Russians made some minor advancing in that zone. And now uh, we observe quite intensive battles uh, in so-called Kremina forest over here. 
but uh, it is some sort of trap for Russian forces, to be honest with you, because of uh, coming there, Russians are not able to use their prevalences and advantages, such as a uh, bigger number of uh, armament and uh, artillery. So Russians stuck simply in that location without any further actions. And uh, ongoing battles continues, in, or, or we call it uh, front battles from both front clashes from each side of the con both sides of the conflict over there. So it continues, uh, and you know, sometimes uh, people ask me what's going on in the, the Bakhmut front, uh, Bakhmut location, and uh, it. Uh, it should be like a pretended to be the main point of battles. It is not correct because we still have another uh, active portions on the front line, sections, excuse me, on the front line. Then let's turn to Bakhmut front. As you can see, sir, sorry, I tried to, to find the latest update uh, from that uh, one of the most uh, informative uh, source, uh, as I may say, but over here, you may see a composition of troops around the Bakhmut. As a general uh, perspective and a detailed map regarding the situation in the city of Bak Bakhmut. So general idea looks like the following. Russians now trying to push from three directions, from the north, inside of the city, and from the south. Why? Because of over here, there is a name of the village uh, Hromove which is one of the key point in Ukrainian defense. Through the Hromove pass the way uh, connecting uh, Bakhmut with the Kostantinivka through the Chasiv Yar over here. So with that regard, Russians desperately try to cut off that line of communication over there. And simultaneously, which really surprised me to be perfectly honest with you, they try to reach another location such as Dubovo Vasilevka, another location so over here, why it surprised me? Because of, you know, it looks quite weird. Uh, Russians use like an open palm strategy, trying to get any points there, but it may exhaust their military capabilities. And I don't know, but at any day, maybe today, maybe tomorrow, maybe it will not happen, but who knows? Because it's it, it, a little bit out of the discussion regarding the military aspect of operation. Uh, we are talking about the political demands of the Kremlin to gain that location. But from the military perspective, uh, any advances over there in such kind of the manner, open palm, as I can say, may be cut it off from the direction, from the south and from the north. So uh, nobody knows who will be entrapped. Ukrainian forces or Russian forces at the moment. But situation is not clear at the moment and Russian forces trying to push, I, I say not advance, but push through the Ukrainian positions. Partially uh, they do successful uh, uh, advances on the north. However, I can't say the same on the south uh, where Ukrainian forces uh, after a series of counterattacks uh, really uh, in reality stopped Russian advances from the south, and it allowed Ukrainian forces to keep positions uh, in Bakhmut using the line of connection, uh, direct line of connection from Bakhmut to Kostantinivka. As you can see over there, and uh, that uh, blue arrow shows the direction of Ukrainian uh, counter -off uh, offensive actions in the city of Bakhmut. This is the reality of the situation. Also, pay your attention over here. When open sources and other sources mentioned that the Russian forces uh, advance inside of the Bakhmut to the river Bakhmutka, it is clearly mentioned over here and we can confirm it. Is it a critical thing? Uh, actually not. Because of uh, this, this part of the city of Bakhmut is uh, mainly part where we have uh, low floor buildings or we call it like a village part of the Bakhmut. Uh, and this side of the Bakhmut is uh, on the uh, upper hill, which allow Ukrainian forces to conduct uh, artillery attacks and mortar attacks against the Russian forces. Also, you can imagine that even in a small river such as Bakhmutka here, maybe like a barrier for Russian troops trying to get a, to gain position on another side of the river Bakhmutka. So battle is ongoing. And if you would like to ask me about the 
why it is so important, uh, I may say it, it's about common sense of the operation. Russians still have like a prevalence in the personnel. And uh, there is only one possible uh, course of action when Ukrainian forces are able to uh, chop, as we use it, uh, definition, to chop Russian forces over there and exhaust their uh, military capabilities. As you saw from the previous map provided by the deep state map with those colors, uh, you can see that Russians uh, even now not able to concentrate their troops in uh, all locations of the front line over there who cool. let me take a break a little bit i saw some qu uh, questions probably uh-huh uh yeah. yeah so not nothing special well let me continue uh, and now I would turn your attention to another very, very important uh, section of, of the front line. The next active section of the front line is the Avdeevka front. We don't mention it quite often in the mass media also try to avoid that location. But this location, to my point of view, even more important than Bakhmut right now. Because of uh, Avdiivka as a municipality located close, uh, locates close to the Donetsk which uh, influenced significantly to the situation in Donetsk as a part of uh, so-called uh, Donetsk People Republic. And uh, it is uh, literally the point where Russians did not advance since the beginning of wild scale, uh, wide scale offensive action. So uh, Avdeevka front remains quite stable despite of Russian attempts to surround that location from south as you can see, and from the north, where desperate clashes continues even now, even today. And in general, you can see it right here, how it looks like from the broader perspective, as uh, we call it Donetsk Front. And uh, let me, oh, excuse me, excuse me. And uh, many people ask me uh, and uh, pay attention to Vugledar location. Over here, sorry. It's a, it's a Vilika, uh, Vilika Novosilki, my favorite place. And uh, when the situation will calm down, I do recommend to visit that location because they have a, a brilliant Greek Cheburex over there. <laughs> so uh, about, uh, about Vugledar, uh, you know, dear friends, I would say uh, this location is the most important, to be perfectly honest with your uh, location on our front right now. Why? Because of if you will glance on the map, you will see that the distance between Vugledar and Mariupol is reachable for long range missiles of Ukrainian uh, defense forces and uh, artillery. Also, I, I have mentioned already that uh, Russian logistics mainly depend on the railway. And that is why, excuse me for the quality of that map, I try to be short with my presentation. Uh, you. You may imagine, or trust me at least, uh, there is two main uh, railway junctions and locations on this map, Roz uh, Volnovakha and Rozivka, which are reachable to Ukrainian artillery and the missiles right now. It significantly impact Russian ability to increase their defense capabilities on the South Front. Moreover, you know, if before in our analysis, we mentioned location of Melitopol as a key, uh, of further offensive actions of Ukrainian armed forces uh, um, on the south, I would say as that the Mariupol now may be absolutely equivalent location for further development of offensive. Why? Because of if Ukrainian forces would be able to cut off that corridor over here, Russians force, uh, Russian forces will be trapped on the south with a very, very limited uh, ability to withdraw from that location without losses or they will be forced to come back, to return to Crimea and they will be blocked there. It's, uh, that is why Russians desperately try to reach that location and attack and capture Vugledar as the strategic location uh, in our front right, right now. And uh, this, is, uh, this, this is about so-called Eastern Front at the moment. Now let's turn to so-called Western Front, uh, South Front, uh, sorry. And as you can see here, there is no like a real battle actions at the moment. Yes, uh, 
each uh, everyday reports mentioned uh, numerous uh, bombardments and shelling of the positions of both sides of the conflict. However, no further advances. Uh, is it, uh, can we call it like a silent front? No, it is not because of, I spoke with the friends and the official, official reports coming from uh, military sources mentioned that the frequency of shelling there is about 20 hours per day, 20 hours per day. So despite of uh, real changes in the situation on the map, on the ground, uh, we still have quite exhaustive phase of the battle. And I can't say that the exhaustive uh, phase of the battle is a good option for Russians. Because of, if you will glance on the map here, in a Kherson direction, I call that location so-called uh, Kherson Triangle. Why it is important to understand, uh, this zone is under permanent control, fire control of Russian, uh, or excuse me, Ukrainian uh, rockets, missiles, and artillery over there. That is why, if you remember that map, Russians are very careful to deploying troops over there to avoid putting them under direct, uh, direct fire of Ukrainian uh, defense forces over there. And uh, it is prevent, it's prevent me another question, uh, which quite often asked me uh, by people, when Ukraine will start uh, attack in that direction. Ukraine will never start uh, offensive actions from that direction because it will need to pass through the Dnipro River, which is technically and military very exhaustive operations and, and will need a lot of capabilities to organize and Ukrainian uh, defense forces simply do not have such a capabilities to allow them. But actually, it doesn't make any sense from that perspective because of, in case of attack to Melitopol, pay attention to this map, Tokmak and Melitopol over there, uh, Ukrainian forces would be able to achieve their aims over there, cutting off communication between mainland of Russian Federation and Crimea, which is the most important aim for common counter offensive and offensive uh, operations of Ukrainian armed forces in the nearest perspective. Cool. Well, and this is... Uh, uh, Siri, Siri, if we can have a question on that, if we can just go back to the previous slide, because th there's a question about the Mykolaiv region, yes? Yes. So the question from Dennis is, Mykolaiv region is suffering from absence of drinking water supply because water is sourced from Dnipro, and mm -hmm. the Russians all the time attack facilities located on the right bank nearby Kherson. Is there any possibility to protect facilities in a way to ensure continuous water sourcing and supply? No, unfortunately not. Unfortunately not, uh, and answer is clear why, because the Russians also quite clearly realize the importance of uh, such source. And they try to exhaust uh, facilities of Ukrainian side, uh, destroying them permanently. And any attempts to recover those facilities uh, are failed because normally failed because of Russian uh, Russian forces concentrated on those facilities, conducting permanent shelling and attacking those facilities day by day. It is technically impossible, and you know, I are understanding that some context of. Uh, uh, our presentation may be not acceptable for the people. Uh, I may refer to the pictures about the city or locations which previously named city of Marienka to understand what's going on there. Uh, I will show you later the frequency of artillery attacks uh, on locations not related to the front line. So I specially selected that information so you may understand and you may imagine uh, how intensive shelling of those locations are at the moment. But the uh, answer is no, unfortunately not. We can't rely on the Dnieper sources at the moment because of the Dnieper, uh, Dnieper River is a zone of real military operations right now. In the future, if Ukrainian offensive actions will be successful, um, on the south direction, I'm, I'm talking about the Melitopol, we may anticipate the situation will improve. Moreover, I would like to say, having uh, quite often charts with the people, and I, I still have our consultants in a Herson Oblast, and uh, my colleagues told me that uh, in some locations, after liberation, uh, electricity appear in some locations after three months only. And it was not guaranteed that electricity will be like a permanent convenience. 
for the people because of they still uh, suffering from the permanent uh, shelling. And day by day, uh, the location of Hearthstone and neighboring locations uh, such as Melitop, or, um, excuse me, Nik Nikopol, and other locations are under permanent shelling of Russian uh, artillery, despite of their declarations of limits of uh, artillery shells there. It is not correct, to be honest with you. Uh, well, Okay, uh, are there any additional questions? Because yeah, I mean, on the southern fronts, there's a question regarding supply uh, via the Kerch Bridge, which is now uh, fully operational also for civilian Russian traffic. If the train line Donetsk Krim can be cut and the Kerch Bridge can be taken out again, how do you assess the survivability of the southern front and Krim for the Russians? And then mm -hmm. a follow up question on that how do you assess the opportunities for the Ukrainian defense forces to manage? to cut these supply routes? Yeah, it is clear, and thank you for that question. It is very important. You should realize that the uh, idea of cutting of the so-called uh, ground corridor is the main strategic idea and the aim of Ukrainian uh, defense forces, uh, forces in the common operations. Why? Because of uh, then the traffic capability of the Kerch bridge will be quite limited. Because of you know they have uh, as a bridge as a location they are able to pass maybe uh, twenty four trains per day only, and uh, adding here uh, civilian needs for the population who uh, which will stay in Crimea so it will significantly limit capability of uh, logistic of Russian Federation. Uh, and in addition to that, you know, advancing to the sea coast of Azov will allow Ukrainian uh, military capabilities to start start uh, influencing uh, fire influencing of the Kerch Bridge. And frankly speaking, I was surprised when after the attack on the Kerch Bridge in autumn, Russians were spent so much time to recover it. Technically, uh, for me as a former railway engineer, uh, it may, may take like two weeks only, but they spent two months to recover full traffic capability of the bridge. That is why the bridge as an object is very, very vulnerable at the moment. And frankly speaking, I would like to recommend military commanders to destroy the bridge fully just to make like a so-called one civilian light, uh, line to allow people to get out from Crimea and uh, personnel. And let me uh, turn to historical examples and uh, all of uh, military history from the 20th century said that any attempts of any army to defend, uh, to organize defense in Crimea failed. If Crimea, would be a blocked location, any attempts of defense will fail over there because of Crimea by the geography of that location is not capable to organize any defensive line which would be efficient and effective to protect any offensive actions from the north, from the mainland. It, it happened in 1920, it happened in 1941, when General Manstein attacked uh, Soviet forces in Crimea, having no even one single tank. And it happened in 1944 when the Red Army came back to Crimea. So uh, it is a, um, let's say, logic of operation. Uh, on the first stage, uh, cut uh, the ground corridor between Russia and Crimea, then push back uh, Russian forces from so called uh, Kherson Triangle to Crimea and then liberate Crimea. It's achievable action and uh, from military perspective, it is, as uh, I have to reiterate, it is the most important action, also from the perspective of doing business. You should realize after liberation of Crimea and deployment of uh, uh, fire sources of Ukrainian armed uh, defense forces to Crimea, we may say that uh, Russian capabilities, military capabilities or fleet capabilities in Crimea will be, will be limited by on the eastern angle of uh, Black Sea, which open corridors for trade, for supplies uh, in western uh, part of uh, Black Sea at the mm -hmm. moment, which is important not only from the perspective of military operations, but for development of economy of Ukraine right now. Mm -hmm. 
So he, we have some more questions regarding the, this area, especially Mikolaev. I know we have a lot of interest in Mikolaev. I know we have a lot of interest from Mikolaev from our uh, agricultural traders and because the ports still are not opened. But the question is, uh, what kind of threats do you see for the business recovery in Mikolaev? For what do we need to pay attention and for what to, to what do we need to be prepared in the region? So the business recovery in, in, in Mikolaev, what, what do we need to prepare for? Well, uh, uh, as for me, as for me, uh, I would say that the main threat for us will be mines and unexploded devices at the moment. Right now, as you can see, there is no even one reasonable uh, reasonable uh, movement from Russian side to attack Mikolaev. And the, uh, we do not anticipate any military operations against the Mikolaev and Oblast, except, except South location where those locations are under permanent fire. I am talking about the like a sea coast of the Black Sea. And uh, we could consider or discuss any options of uh, expanding of, or resuming of business over there after liberation of the uh, Herson Triangle. Right now, as you can see, the Jarel Gach location is under control of Russian Federation and Kimbun, uh, Kimbun Park. So uh, without liberation, we can't open any movements, uh, sea cargo movements through that strait over there. So it is an important to understand that after liberation of this zone, the Herson Triangle, we could consider uh, any available options to uh, resume operations. Also, uh, with regard of possible attacks, we, we, we could say, and I will mention on an example of Kyiv, uh, a threat of using of specified missiles of Russian Federation. We can't exclude it. And those uh, missiles, uh, I put it in a separate slide to under, uh, to explain the uh, dangers of those missiles, may impact sig significantly um, normal life and operations in the Mikolaev Oblast at the moment. However, however, let me uh, come back to that location when we will discuss the minefields over there and the uh, mine pollution, which is for me, from the perspective of doing and resuming of the business, because we are, as an institution, as a World Bank, uh, are very and very interesting about the resuming of our operations, because we are, sorry, it's not like a commercial, but it is a reality, we are uh, one of the most, uh, the biggest donor to Ukraine econ uh, Ukrainian econ uh, economy so far, and it is part of my interest, uh, as soon as I'm responsible, not only for physical, but for operational security also. Yes, Mikolaev is uh, liberated. Mikolaev has uh, uh, some capabilities, but those capabilities uh, are very and very limited from the perspective of possible missile strikes, uh, mine and unexploded devices pollution, and possible limitations with uh, limitations with power and social supplies over there. Mm -hmm. So he just a few more questions we got coming in. So. Uh, said he please advise on the situation near the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Well, yes, thank you for that question. <laughs> because of you know, uh, it, it is an interesting part, and uh, I spend a lot of time discussing that option with the IAEA guys over there. And uh, dear friends, what can I say? Can we anticipate deterioration in the zone of uh, Zaporizhia nuclear power plant? Yes, we could. Uh, is it a luckily scenario or unluckily scenario? It, uh, I would say it is less luckily scenario. However, right now, Russians do everything possible just to increase level of probability of uh, best scenario. Why? Because of the release of water from uh, Kakhovka Reservoir, which significantly decreased level of water in the so-called basin of a uh, nuclear power plant station, which may impact uh, explo uh, exploitation of, of the nuclear power plant station. Also, Russians use a nuclear power plant station as the location of their troops and uh, which make me real, real, really scared, they put it, uh, they create their uh, warehouse and ammunition storage over there, which is uh, very dangerous. Even, even from the perspective, it is another aspect of um, threat that uh, unauthorized personnel 
now have a free access to the nuclear power plant station. You know, uh, everywhere in the, uh, around the globe, nuclear power plants and nuclear objects are a high level protected zone with a very limited authorization for personnel to come in there. Having unauthorized personnel uh, equipped with the arm, uh, it is a, 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 an additional concern to the development of the situation. From another perspective, why I always mention it, that it's less like uh, lucky list scenario or unlucky list scenario, because of in general, what do we have there? The layers of protection of that facility are very, very high, uh, high to prevent any uh, incidents over there. Moreover, you know, it's uh, based on my discussion with uh, responsible guys from IAEA, organization, they mentioned that, uh, Sergi, you can't imagine how many detectors uh, installed around each particular, each uh, nuclear objects around the globe. And even one uh, impact of those detectors immediately caused it to quite quick and uh, effective reaction. Uh, as an example, uh, guys from a uh, nuclear organization, let's call them like there, try to get to the station a couple months before two, detect uh, two detectors uh, in the zone of station stop to respond to the center. So after that, the delegation of a nuclear organization get an access to that uh, power plant after one week. It is quite clear from the perspective of uh, effectiveness of the business to understand uh, how uh, how big and importance of those uh, reactions and those detectors and other equipment over there uh, and uh, other parts of conflict or other parts in the globe have enough instrument to, uh, of influence to get an access to the station. Mm -hmm. Right now, we have a permanent presence of uh, nuclear organization personnel on rotation basis. And uh, it is about third part of our presentation in April, but uh, I did my safe training, uh, teaching those guys uh, who will replace a permanent uh, observers on the nuclear station over there. That is why to conclude, we can discuss it broader because of I stole indeed some slides from presentations and uh, we are ready to discuss it in, in any way. But uh, to conclude uh, my message about this one, yes, there is a potential threat of uh, nuclear related incident, but the level of that threat is uh, very low at the moment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Zadi, just um, uh, since we're on the, um, the front line still, so um, the talk of the counteroffensive. So there's a lot of talk about counteroffensive uh, over the next uh, couple of, of months. Question is, how realistic is this? What scenario will be applied? And what's your forecast? Will Donetsk and Luhansk occupied regions be destroyed like Mariupol and Marinka, or will it be left by Russians more like Kherson? Okay, let me, let me turn to this location, it, uh, to this map about the current. Uh, as you can see here, from the perspective of operations, we may assume that the further operations, offensive operations of the Ukrainian army will uh, will happen on the south direction, in this corridor. I have mentioned already Mariupol direction from uh, Solidar, or excuse me, Vugledar, and from here, from zone of the Zaporizhia front directly to Melitopol, which is, as you can see here, is a real key position. Does Ukraine have a capability to launch such an offensive? Day by day, I become more and more confident uh, to say it does. It does because of right now we uh, have an information about the training of Ukrainian forces in Europe. And at the end of March, which is after two or three weeks only, Ukrainian will have uh, additional at least 10,000 trained troops there. In addition uh, uh, to that, I have to say, based on my internal uh, chats with uh, responsible commanders, that the level of support by armament and equipment coming from the West to Ukraine significantly increased over the last two months. Uh, 
since the beginning of this year. And uh, we uh, we also create a lot of, uh, we are as uh, Ukrainian uh, defense forces, Ukraine creates a lot of new uh, units. And uh, referring to the mainland net, uh, you, you will discover, you will explore that, uh, that source, you will see that there are many and many units of the brigade level. I count, if I'm not mistaken, something about 12 brigades. And I didn't count a National Guard Brigade or a, as they call it, Storm Brigade or Assault Brigade, eight of them. So uh, based on that, I would like to say that there is no even one new uh, established brigade participating now in the active battle clashes uh, on the Eastern Front, which is fully uh, agreed with the um, idea and the uh, provision of the Ukrainian general staff to exhaust Russian forces using so-called old troops over there equipped with uh, post-Soviet uh, armament and equipment over there. Uh, it's add me uh, additional confidential, uh, confidentiality that Ukrainian forces would be able to attack Russian forces. But there are some limits, and main limits is about uh, long-range missiles, and second one, second one is about the anti-aircraft systems, and the third one about the aviation support. You should realize deployment of heavy equipment and armament ground equipment and armament will need a high level protection from the sky, from the air. Because of, if we'll imagine, let's imagine that Ukrainian will launch offensive to the south. Don't forget that the uh, location of Crimea has a very well developed uh, military infrastructure, including airfields over there. So Russian may use the aircrafts counterattacking Ukrainian uh, armored columns uh, advancing to the south. So it may be not so effective way of doing operations, uh, having no protection from the air. That is why Ukrainian political uh, power wing uh, tried to get any uh, positive results. Uh, well, I say begging for the airplanes. It is not like a will of Ukraine because they will to have it as a fancy stuff. It is a, a real way. Uh, uh, it is a real will of Ukraine because of it will support with the counteroffensive actions. Regarding the forecast, what can I say? I am quite careful in my forecast regarding the time of operation. I may assume it may happen at the end of the spring and the beginning of uh, summer. From my perspective, based on the schedule of deployment of uh, armament equipment and the uh, training schedule of Ukrainian troops over there. Also, in my understanding, in my understanding, we will not, uh, well, excuse me, Ukraine would be not able to liberate all occupied territories during this year, unfortunately. Because of, if you will glance on the map and uh, please uh, refer to map on the beginning of our presentation with those colors uh, about the concentrations of troops, it may be easier way to liberate South part of Ukraine, including Crimea, which I, uh, I can see very reachable and uh, realistic, but you should realize that the offensive operations against the Eastern Front will need additional uh, efforts and uh, concentration of absolutely different numbers of troops. Because of even during the 2014 year of operation, Ukrainian forces at that time were able to liberate the most of the parts of uh, previously occupied territory, including north of Lugansk Oblast and south of Donetsk Oblast. But this zone, as we call it, center of Donetsk Oblast, in reality is a one big city. One big city. And you can imagine that the, any efforts uh, to liberate in direct attack uh, all of those locations will need an abnormal number, quantity and quality of troops. Because of those troops will be simply dispersed in the so-called street battles over there. And you know the main tools of uh, offensive actions such as the tank, armored vehicles, aviation, artillery uh, would be useless dealing with uh, street battles over there where we have like a exhaustive uh, infantry battles uh, during the long period of time, as we have it right now in Bakhmut. So you can imagine in a mirror, 
to have that liberation uh, moving from the west to the east, dealing with the same location, with the high urban density locations over there. Also, don't forget that this territory to compare with the, uh, with the south uh, has a very strong backbone uh, and uh, rely on Russian support uh, from different directions. So you can imagine how many lines of supply may be used by Russians to keep those territories under control to compare with this part of, of uh, Ukraine at the moment. That is why I may assume that um, the most effective scenario of the development would be liberation of the south of Ukraine in the nearest perspective. Then it will need additional preparation and additional campaign to liberate uh, other territory of Ukraine at the moment. Mm -hmm. This is my vision at the moment. Okay, so thanks. Far. Uh, said he, and a very tangible question regarding the south in terms of Kakhovka, especially. So the question is, um, there were some assessments that due to uh, an area reachable for Ukrainian artillery, uh, the Russians will move their forces down to Skadovsk and Chaplinka and leave Kakhovka area. However, we do not see that. What is your assessment of such a chance? Yeah, um, absolutely. Well, uh, uh, when I mention, uh, uh, thank you, it, it's a reasonable question, but I have mentioned it already. Ukrainian army will never uh, cross the river from that direction, from the direction of uh, Kherson Oblast, because of, it does not make any sense due to specific of uh, the geography of the territory. That is why if you are talking about the liberation of Kakhovka, uh, we may uh, assume uh, that option only from the perspective of uh, advance of Ukrainian troops to direction of Melitopol. So if that territory will be cut off uh, from the Russian corridor, or that corridor will be cut off, and as soon as we have that triangle under permanent control right now of Ukrainian uh, fire sources, uh, just as for your understanding, Ukraine artillery and missiles did from 20 and the aviation did from 20 to 40 strikes per day in different locations. So that is why you may imagine how difficult for Russians to keep under control the territory. I may assume it is also my provision as soon as Ukrainian forces will reach the zone of Genichesk and the sea coast of Azov, Russian forces will be forced, sorry for tautology, to withdraw to Crimea without damaging, without any clashes in that particular location, because they would be not able to protect those locations as they were not able to protect the zone of the right bank of the river Dnipro in the Kherson Oblast. Scenario is the same. It is not my forecast, it is a reality. Scenario is the same. Ukrainian forces permanently influenced to that zone, cutting, uh, cut it off a uh, Russian supply, uh, supply uh, chain uh, from Crimea to that zone. So uh, those part of Crimea is under permanent uh, fire control of the Ukrainian forces. Not this one, but this one definitely is. That is why Russians would be not able to keep their position when Ukrainian forces will uh, will be on the sea uh, on the sea coast of Azov Sea. Next, yes, thank you. Okay, guys, because uh, at the end we will have a few scenarios. Uh, it was not my idea. I, I, I refer many times that I, I do appreciate civil line sources, and uh, those scenarios, to from my perspective, looks quite reasonable. But let's discuss it later. Who? Oh, what do we have now? Uh, and uh, from our geography, let me turn to some figures. And uh, I uh, offer you this information based on a United Nations assessment regarding the situation with the shell, shelling of uh, Ukrainian territory by missiles and uh, drones. It is a general information. I beg your pardon because uh, I found only available information from October to the latest uh, big uh, and massive attack of uh, Russian forces against the Ukrainian infrastructure. You may see how frequent were those attacks over there and uh, Russians Russians try to use like a combined forces over there using uh, drones attack and uh, missiles attack and uh, you can see the percentage 
graphically it's it's visual i guess percentage of uh, success attacks and uh shot it down missiles in each particular case as you can see despite of very wide discussed uh, option of drones drones is uh, drones are not uh, obvious things and obvious part of a uh, weapon using by Russians because of drone cap drones capabilities of Russian federations are very limited and they in case of attacking drones or battle drones they must uh, rely on the support of uh, the Iranian allies but uh, Iranian uh, Iranian capacity to produce and send drones to Russia is quite limited as you can see here so Russians may able to use drones in uh, very short uh, capabilities. And uh, those attacks not so effective as Russians uh, expected to see. Also, I did my personal assessment regarding the um, balance of uh, effective attack since 21st of February to today, actually. It's a latest update over here. So as you can see, in normal way, we have like a quite effective balance between uh, missile attack and shot down missiles. However, latest one need our particular attention and I would like to explain it in detail why it happened actually. Because the Russians here use a big number of so-called uh, ballistic missiles. And uh, to be honest, uh, I do not let's say discover a top secret information but there is no even one single system air defense system which uh, definitely pro will provide 100 percent of protection it is technically impossible to achieve such a result that is why the layer of layers of protection must be different and depends of each particular threat which may we may uh, which we may face with here we have a quite significant threat from the ballistic missiles because of uh, Ukrainian uh, air defense consisted of old fashioned Soviet types, old fashioned Western side uh, types of uh, air defense uh, systems. And uh, presumably we will have soon a Patriot system, which will make a difference in a, that percentage. However, we face with a significant threat of uh, ballistic missiles from the Russian side. Why? Uh, and uh, there are some statistics. Uh, what happened over there? It is about the situation in Kyiv. How the city of Kyiv, uh, in summary, was impacted by uh, the numbers of those missiles from the period uh, uh, of the beginning of the wild scale invasion till the mid of February. Sorry, I didn't get any additional information. But it is about the losses of Kyiv as a city just for your understanding. And then uh, I add some slides here referring to the um, understanding on why uh, we have such a big impact of those missiles. And as you can see here, all of those old fashioned missiles, not so precise or accurate as we can see. And uh, Russians may use it like a general tool of terror. I have to mention especially that Russians uh, do not use those missiles in the territory of uh, where we have a uh, battle clashes. However, Russian use those missiles against um, uh, civilian locations in Ukraine. And the second part is about like a ballistic missiles. And I separated in two main portions, such as uh, we uh, we observed yesterday attack by the ballistic missiles of uh, Kinjal and Iskander. Actually, both of them are the same. They are ballistic missiles with the different types of launching. This is ground launching missile. This is air launching missile as a Kinjal. And you can see different speed. And speed here is the main impact for the defensive system to react. Because of uh, using that speed, uh, Russians are able to hit many and many targets in Ukraine. And over here, I, wait, uh, I would like to pay your particular attention to this portion, a C-400 missile. Previously, we didn't uh, mention it in our analyze uh, because of uh, those missiles were not widely used uh, during the operation in Ukraine, and we more referred to the C S-300 missiles. 
but those missiles normally use again the uh, certain locations uh, around the front line. And at the end of the presentation, you will see why uh, those locations are uh, recognized as a uh, high threat level zones. Mm -hmm. Because so just a very quick question yeah. on, on the two ballistic, on the Kinjal and the Iskandrias. Uh, I mean, if it's traveling at 12,000 kilometers an hour, I mean, th th does Ukraine currently have any air defense systems to, to stop uh, the, the ballistic missiles? Almost not. And that is why you saw results from yesterday. From 81 missiles, only 34 of them were intercepted and destroyed. Almost not. And this is the main threat. Also referring what, to... What would the Patriots uh, defend? We will see. Uh, we will see. Uh, I can't be absolutely confident because, of, you know, uh, any system uh, must be re uh, might, must be assessed from the perspective of challenge and response. So because of, it depends on the capability and level of training of the personnel and so on and so on. We will see indeed in the future uh, the balance between a uh, launched missile and a uh, destroyed missile will, will change, as we saw in case of drones. But as of now, it is a real impact for us. Yeah, that is why I especially mentioned, and I wait until today morning just to add some figures based on official statistics regarding that. So this is our reality, unfortunately. Also, it's about like uh, precision of uh, targets. You may imagine it's like a 500 kilos of explosive materials. What kind of uh, impact may be there? But let me turn to uh, air defense missiles. Uh, they are modernized to be used uh, from uh, in a more in a model surface to surface, and those missiles has also supersonic speed, which uh, made them very very dangerous for us. And uh, here there is an example how those missiles may impact Kiev. And that is why I always remind my personnel, and I will also remind here, guys, in case of air attack, if you have an information of using missiles, in particular, this uh, this type of missiles, S-400, please take your shelters. As you can see, those missiles are not so precise and can't be used against uh, uh, military installation and facilities. However, it is a huge a big threat. It is not my emotion, it is a reality. It is a huge threat for civilian population and civilian facility. Why? Because of special combination of the warhead. As an anti-aircraft missile, you, you can see a comparison. It's like a 480 kilograms of explosive materials and only 180 explosive, uh, kilograms of explosive materials here. But the tricky thing is that the warhead of this missile consists of not only like explosive materials, but also shrapnel elements, which significantly increase range of impact of those rockets. And I say, uh, I have to say again, it is a real threat of terror. We can't hide from those missiles somewhere, uh, let's say staying in, in, in your houses, in your accommodations. It is about shrapnel. So uh, range of shrapnel is a quite big one. The density of that shrapnel is a huge one. That is why uh, if you are talking about the threat for our locations, yes, we are under threat in Kyiv now due to the uh, big number of those missiles in Russian Federation. In addition to that, you may assume more or less the same standards of S-300 missiles, but it is not like a direct threat for Kyiv so far at the moment, but it is a direct threat for locations such as Kharkiv, Zaporizhia, Kherson, and uh, some districts of uh, Dnipropetrovsk Oblast from those missiles. It is also about our, um, let's say, assumptions of uh, resuming of business and operations in those locations. Because the, as you can see, supersonic uh, speed in combination of uh, close location, it's like uh, those missiles uh, can hit uh, targets. I'm talking about the C-400 uh, on the distance of 220 kilometers, eventually 260 kilometers, to be honest. And uh, you can imagine in case of uh, Sume, Chernigiv, and other location neighboring to the Russian Federation of using of S-300. 
uh, which has a uh, effective range is about 150 kilometers. So all locations uh, closer than that distance are under permanent threat of uh, C3 S300 missiles, which is again uh, is not like a military tool. It is a terrorist tool. So, sorry, I, I have to, I haven't used. I, I don't need. No, I am not allowed to use such a emotional definition. But it is a real a reality of our situation. It is. It has nothing to do with the military operation. It is a real terroristic weapon of Russian Federation. Then. It is about the drone. It is also my assessment based on the situation uh, almost one month. Uh, as you can see, uh, Ukrainian air, uh, air forces and uh, anti-aircraft systems and uh, defense forces achieved quite remarkable results uh, to destroy uh, drones as a type of the weapon. That is why Russians try to minimize uh, their using and they use more, uh, them uh, mostly in a uh, option of uh, reconnaissance. So normally, uh, what kind of attack did they do before? They launched drones to discover options of uh, and the position of anti-aircraft defense, made some changes in the uh, tracking of uh, missiles and then send missiles. Also, you may imagine that drones may also impact some uh, objects and uh, they did. They did, and the uh, carriage of explosive materials is about from 20 to 40 kilograms, depends on the range and distance of using those drones. But in fact, it is a good example how Ukrainian forces now are prepared to respond to such a threat over there. It, it's about the statistic only. And then it is about the artillery and mortar fire. And I pay. I would like to pay your particular attention to zones located to the front line. Those figures about the numbers, such as uh, 40, 50, and uh, in average 30, mentioned uh, artillery attacks against the locations close to the front line. And I repeat again, it is about Kharkiv, Dnipropetrovsk, Zaporizhia, and Kherson Oblast mostly. So it is about your provision of resuming of business and operation over there in those lines. So you may simply put like a line in 20 kilometers, 25 up to 40 kilometers distance, just to make and imagine and uh, see the results of possible attacks because the Russians still use artillery widely over there. And every day uh, we have uh, almost 30 uh, attacks of Russian artillery against the locations around the front line. And I especially mentioned those figures are not related to the battle activity, to the combat activity. It is about the attacks against the civilian installation and facilities and locations uh, around the front, uh, along the front line. Every day shelling. <laughs> Any questions about that? Great. Let me move forward. Here, dear friends, uh, I. So there is so, so just on that point, there is a question we've got. So um, the question is: Do I understand correctly that Russia has a possibility to shell Kiev with S four hundred from Belarus? Are they present in Belarus? The S four hundreds. Yes. Answer is yes, and Russians did it. Once a time, Russians did it, and uh, I especially reflect this one because uh, this zone because it happened. In, it happened not precisely from the territory of Belarus. However, Russians deployed a lot of uh, missiles to, uh, launchers to Belarus, and potentially they are able to attack by S four hundred missiles from the territory of Belarus. Uh, well, now uh, here I would like to offer you that map, uh, and uh, uh, I can't say I like that map because it is not true. It is about another aspect of our security situation in Ukraine. It is about uh, mined slash unexploded device pollution around Ukraine. And as you may see, uh, so you can re uh, rely on this link, open and uh, in detail see all locations. Uh, which may have an interest for you. 
but in general, in general, it is about the mine pollution situation. According to official information, about 30% of Ukrainian territory are highly polluted by uh, mine and unexploded devices. And here, there are some official statistics, which I also found on official sources as a, a state uh, emergency service of Ukraine sources. In 2022, since the beginning of uh, uh, invasion, you may, uh, you may see how many officially uh, reported mines and unexploded devices where they activated. It's a huge number. And pay particular attention to this one. It is about the air bombs over there. More than 2,000 air bombs were deactivated during the operation, the mining operations during only last year. And here's the fresh figures about the situation with the deactivation uh, and uh, mine pollution uh, this year. Two months, you may imagine, it, it is not actually two months because those figures are fresh from day of March 9th. You can refer uh, to those figures and find it openly in uh, official sources. You may see how many mines and uh, unexploded devices were deactivated. Moreover, uh, my uh, one of my uh, education is about the, not demining but uh, mine plan of uh, officer and uh, specialist. I may say that all of those mines and uh, unexploded devices are very and very dangerous. It is only official figures which are I recognize very very careful. You should realize, and uh, we based on another assessment that. Uh, roughly 40% of all ammunition which have run through the barrels did not explode. I remember my visits quite often, visit permanent visit to the Eastern conflict area before uh, invasion started. And I may say that uh, I'm quite confident about the percentage. What happened actually, because of both sides of conflict, let me call it like this one, use quite old ammunition. And that ammunition did not explode, but it's still very and very dangerous, very and very dangerous. That is why it is the main, I would like, it is the main impact to resuming of our business and operations in, in a uh, perspective, even in liberated territory right now, because of this, those figures are from liberated territories only, including Kiev, Chernigiv, Sume, and Kharkiv Oblast and Kherson Oblast indeed. Uh, I could say that in some uh, in some situation, uh, we have, as soon as we have some meetings with our counterparts dealing with uh, IFC, International Financial Corporation, uh, our counterpart said that they were able to reach their facilities after three months after liberation, only after three months, when uh, demining operations were finished in the, those zones. So you may imagine how huge impact of, de, uh, of uh, mine and unexploded devices pollution right now. Moreover, moreover it, it is about the personal sa uh, safety and security of our personnel. Because of, you know, in a liberated location of Kyiv Oblast, we found, not we found, uh, Ukrainian uh, responsible uh, agencies found a lot of bobby traps and mines specially installed in uh, inhabitant localities. And it is additional impact for everybody. We should be very, very careful using that. Then some pictures and some, some just examples, what happens there. I do, uh, you know, guys, if, if I will put all information here, you will be impressed because, because of it will take another half an hour just mentioning all, all of those bullets over there. I just put some examples from official sources about that. You may face with that situation everywhere. Is it Chernigiv, uh, Buchar, in a forest? And actually in a forest, I always uh, warn my staff to avoid any uh, walks in, into the forest during last summer because of high level of pollution. We can't predict where you could find it because in some sources, even in key, uh, you could find the uh, unexploded devices uh, detected in Kiev, in some parks almost. So we have to pay particular attention uh, in any planning process referring to this very high threat. 
for our staff and our activities in Ukraine. And I can swear you, uh, if you will decide just to select that news, even in open uh, news, you will find at least one, uh, in, one information per week regarding the explosion in uh, non-battle zones or liberated zones over there. Moreover, I especially put it here because of, you know, some people decided that the Odessa region and seaside is uh, comfortable for vacation and weekends. It is not. It is not, dear friends. So if you will see those signs over there, please do not approach to the sea because of a, a explosion and incident may happen also uh, in the sea or on the sea coast at the moment. And uh, for further questions, we may discuss it indeed, but uh, if you, interest, uh, you are interested about any specific location, please refer to that open map, which is uh, quite detailized at the moment. But you should realize uh, that all of uh, those aspects which we discuss right now will be concentrated in the latest map, as I promised to show you later a little bit. So any questions about mines? Because I can spend, uh, I have special presentation about the mine and how to avoid it. And I would be glad to offer it to you on my behalf. So let me uh, move ahead. Scenarios. Frankly speaking, uh, uh, I use those scenarios based on Sibyl line reports and there are six scenarios and I select it and, and divide it in as a most luckily, according to our discussion during our online meeting with Sibyl Line guys, and uh, less luckily, on uh, unluckily scenario. Also, one of scenario uh, later will uh, refer to the out-of-country situation, and we will discuss maybe a couple aspects of uh, that situation later. At the moment, it is about reality. And I have to say, I put it on the position number one. And it is number one situation, which what can we may face with this, uh, with the uh, first development of the front. In fact, we have a situation when Russians almost exhaust their military capabilities and simply they can't achieve, let's say, uh, any quick results in order to uh, reach the targets and aims in Ukraine. So, and... Uh, we may assume that the situation on the front line, as we observe it right now, will stabilize in the nearest perspective. Because if you know, Russian and Ukrainian sides would be able to launch additional waves of mobilization. Ukrainian side will strongly depend on uh, supply uh, chains from Western allies. But to be, uh, to be honest, uh, dear friends, uh, entire world did not prepare for such a war over the last 30 years. So as I, as I spoke with some of my colleagues from one of country, I can't call uh, I can't call that country, they told me, Sergi, if we would participate in such uh, intensive battle clashes, we will exhaust our uh, storages of ammunition in half an hour. In half an hour. That is why, you know, indeed, Ukrainian authority may uh, demand uh, bigger and bigger amounts of ammunition coming to Ukraine, but reality is quite different. There is no enough uh, quantity of ammunition to be deployed in Ukraine. Also, each country has own responsibility for protection uh, and defense of their own territory and citizens. That is why I'm quite confident to say that uh, we are on the stage where, despite of clear understanding of the necessity to conclude that war in a close perspective, the reality looks quite different. We would, be not a, we would not be able just to accomplish this war this year, as I said before, referring to that kind of scenario. And we may anticipate that the front line may stabilize in a position as we have, or mostly uh, as we have right now at the moment. It is uh, uh, option number one. Option number two, I like it. I like it, and uh, but partially. It is more likely at the moment, but you know, uh, Russians uh, may achieve some 
results in the nearest perspective, in particular of Bakhmut, I would not be surprised to read the news that the Bakhmut, uh, Ukrainian forces will leave Bakhmut soon. It may possible, but as soon as we have a more and more support from the Western allies, we may assume that the Ukrainian forces would be able just to conduct a quite effective offensive actions. But as we discussed already, I wouldn't like to exhaust you more about that. Uh, the, it may be like a sectional offensive actions and the most reachable and reasonable uh, direction of the offensive is the South direction, from my perspective, from my point of view, frankly speaking. Then option number three, successful Russian offensive. Well, <laughs> frankly speaking, I, I don't believe it. I don't believe it because of, you know, Russians uh, are almost exhausted. Moreover, uh, we were waiting, we were anticipating Russian uh, mobilization wave in the mid of January. And after that, I would say, if it would, if it would happen, I would say that this scenario uh, may become scenario number two. But Russians did not launch that uh, wave of mobilization. And uh, it's allowed us to say that Russians will have a very limited capability to conduct such kind of operations. Moreover, depending on increasing support from the Western allies, uh, Russian uh, Ukrainian forces may make that scenario less likely or even unluckily at the moment. And then I put four scenarios over here. Limited escalation because the border of Ukraine. A realistic scenario, yes. Moreover, I would like to pay your attention to the Moldova situation because I did mention it and probably you may have some questions about it. Real situation is the following. Uh, as a security specialist responsible for Moldova, I would say that the Russians uh, military forces in uh, Transnistria extremely limited. And uh, from declared, uh, for uh, mechanized brigade of so-called Transnistrian Republic plus one brigade of Russian forces, they may create only three, I repeat, only three uh, battalion tactical groups only, which uh, general strengthen about 2,000 personnel, which is less than possible to launch any actions. Also, uh, Russian forces in Transnistria is fully blocked. There is no even one single chain of supply. And uh, frankly speaking, all rumors regarding the possible air assault operations in uh, the Chechnya airport looks absolutely unrealistic because of, I am quite confident that the Romanian authority uh, took full responsibility to protect Moldovan territory right now. It must be clear, however, May situation in Moldova change? Yes, it may. Why? Because of another, uh, another sources uh, show that the level of support of so-called pro-Western government of Moldova permanently decreased from 52% to 26%. But in uh, summary, level of support of so-called pro-Russian political forces increased significantly, and now it is more than 50%. So in, in my understanding, Standing in my perspective, in my analyze, I would say that if situation in Moldova change to the situation of uh, ad hoc uh, parliamentary election, we may anticipate changing in the uh, political rhetoric of Moldovan authority after elections, from pro-European to pro-Russian rhetoric. How it will change the situation, who knows, but at least we may anticipate deterioration of a uh, uh, security situation in Odessa, Vinitsa and the Chernivtsi Oblast of Ukraine do that to increase the activity of saboteur groups, which may be there. Mm -hmm. uh, Sergei, a very is... tangible question regarding uh, scenario five, yes. And then mm -hmm. uh, this is extremely important uh, in terms of the grain corridor. Um, and the question is, do you think the chance of the prolongation, I mean, what, what, what is your view on the prolongation? What happens after March 18th with the grain corridor? I think I think it will be prolonged uh, as soon as we had like a visit of the Antonio Gutierrez two days ago in Ukraine. And it is a common interest of Russian Federation, to be honest, Turkey, which is a main player and Ukraine indeed. So all 
players in this game are on the same wave. It may be some sort of political speculation. Russians will demand something, but in general, based on my assessment, it will be prolonged and extended beyond that uh, the term, for sure. And sixth scenario, destabilization, we are far, far away from that scenario at the moment, to be honest with you. We may consider that scenario as a possible uh, option, but it is not about uh, this year. Any questions about it? I know I exhausted you a little bit, guys, and uh, probably you will have extra questions, but let me, if no, let me come to this map. This is a summary of our discussion from today. And I totally agree with that summary based on the Sibyl line assessment. Uh, I do recommend for those of you who are, who are deeply interested in uh, all of those materials to join the Sibyl line. Uh, they're quite productive and they uh, share everyday reports regarding Ukraine. They have a lot of materials regarding the situation in the region, including Moldova, Belarus. Uh, they're responsible for other aspects of the security, including cybersecurity. But here is a summary of our discussion right now. Based on all of our um, topics, I would like to say, and now you can see what is the uh, options for resuming of business in different parts of Ukraine. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, highly unluckily, any attempts to resume any operations in so-called pre-front territories, such as zone of Kharkiv Oblast, part of Donetsk Oblast, which is zone of active battle clashes, Zaporizhia Oblast and Kherson Oblast, as we mentioned. More or less the same situation uh, observed in Mykolaiv, Dnipropetrovsk Oblast, and uh, in the uh, Oblast neighboring to the Russian Federation, Sume and Chernigiv. And uh, you should realize it is not only uh, based on assessment of military conflict as military conflict and battle clashes in general. It is about the mine pollution. And it is about the per uh, permanent impact of uh, and the attacks of Russian artillery, missiles, and so on, so on, so on. Then we may see another level of uh, uh, approach, and it includes Kiev and the uh, oblast, uh, Poltava region, Lviv and Odessa. Those locations are under permanent and uh, more frequent impact of missiles attack, drone attacks. And in case of Moldova, uh, location with, close to the Transnistria, uh, potentially threatening zone also. And then zone number five, uh, one, two, three, four, five, it's uh, the most uh, safe locations in Ukraine with uh, less impact through, from the missile attacks, uh, from the less impact uh, or almost zero impact from the unexploded and uh, devices and uh, mine activity. However, there are some locations where unexploded missiles or part of missiles may be found in those locations. So now, it's up to you now to make a decision about the resuming of operation. And uh, let me conclude my presentation right now uh, based on assessment of the security situation uh, and considering uh, aspects of the military conflict and um, uh, military conflict in Ukraine. This is what we have at the moment based on the latest assessment. And I fully agree with the assessment of our colleagues from the United Kingdom at the moment. This is our reality, dear friends. Questions about? I finished. Well, super, uh, Sadhi. Thank you for such a comprehensive and detailed and uh, professional um, presentation. Um, I, I do think, again, um, what I would like to reiterate is that this is the first of three of presentations. So we have the next one on March 30th, and that'll be actually focused more on the physical security requirements of protection of personnel, facilities, operations and contingency planning. And then we have a uh, presentation on April 6th, and that'll be about training options and tips for conducting business operations in Ukraine. Today was more uh, the sort of the big picture security situation in terms of perspective of, of, of doing business. So, um, so he, thank you for, for that. I think it, it's a great um, um, update. I think especially, you know, we are preparing for a big event in um, Washington 
on uh, April 13th. This will be the at the US Chamber. Uh, we'll be sharing details shortly. This will be together with the State Department. We expect Secretary Blinken, uh, with USAID, Samantha Power, um, with uh, Department of Commerce and other US uh, state government officials. Uh, but also, I think it will be really the uh, many of the head offices of companies and the, the questions they will be asking is, you know, what are the realities? Because, you know, we have been saying that Ukraine is open for business and we show that the um, uh, realities of, 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 you know, the companies that continue to operate in Ukraine uh, today. Um, and also those getting ready for the biggest reconstruction, modernization, redevelopment of a nation in Europe post uh, World War II. So, so thank you for that. Um, I know we have a few more uh, questions. Um, something uh, again, you know, what, one of your safer, your your this is your fifth uh, safe area. But the question is, given your levels, do you do you not think that the offensive from Belarus? From Volin or Rivne is is possible? No, no. Okay. You you know, especially uh, avoid that uh, as a discussion because it may take another hour. Yeah. And uh, uh, let me be more philosophical with that regard because it is not about like uh, only military perspective. At the moment, it is about the um, society in Belarus, and what I mean, society in Belarus in general. Uh, do not accept an idea of invasion into Ukraine. It is option one. Secondly, I would like to say that the, mm, any offensive from the territory of Belarus uh, without engagement of Russian troops in a reasonable uh, capacity would not be successful because of uh, Belarusian forces has zero military experience in operations. They are very, very post-Soviet country with a very, very post-Soviet uh, military doctrine. And having that, uh, we may have a trigger of possible offensive, a significant deployment of Russian troops, but we can't see that. And it is another aspect of strategic of the war because of in December, uh, January, there were many and many messages coming from the political uh, level of Ukraine uh, mentioning that uh, offensive from Belarus is possible. But uh, their assumption based on uh, possible deployment of uh, Bel uh, Russian troops, and we really observed deployment of Russian troops with increasing of number from 7,000 up to 12,000. What happens then? Then, due to exhaustive battles in the Donbas, Russian were, uh, Russians were forced just to decrease presence in Belarus till the um, 6,000 troops. Now, they are able to use the Belarusian uh, facilities only for training purpose. And that is why I have to state again, the Bel de facto Belarusian authority did all steps in order to be prepared for mobilization without only one latest uh, step to press the button of mobilization. And as soon as we will not see any significant deployment of Russian troops, I could see that any attempts of att uh, and rumors uh, about the offensive from Belarus looks absolutely unrealistic. It is option one. Secondly, I spent uh, at least 12 years of my military career, career operating in that zone. And there are literally five routes which connect Belarus with uh, Ukrainian territory. All of those routes are prepared in a from the operational engineering and battle perspective. I mean, uh, all of those routes are cut off, bridges, uh, convenient locations, and uh, mined. Uh, and in addition to that, we have additional deployment of 17,000 Ukrainian troops to that territory. Moreover, uh, I mentioned it already like a historical perspective. And if I mention in case of Crimea, 100 years of history, here we may refer to 1000 year of history saying that there were no even one single offensive from north to south and from south to north due to lim very, very and very limited uh, capabilities of uh, communication routes over there. Even Russians will deploy a lot of troops uh, their options for offensive would be uh, framed by those rules only. 
because of, I can't see any tank which el, uh, able to uh, move in a swamp or pass through the forest, deep forest and thick forest. So that is why any uh, any attempts of uh, or any information regarding the possible intervention from Belarus looks mostly unrealistic. Mm -hmm. But yeah. at that uh, at that time at that time simul, uh, at that, uh, at this time also uh, when we discussed the option of uh, missile launching from the territory of Belarus, the Belarus authority allowed to deploy a lot of. Uh, a lot of uh, launchers, C3, S300, S400 to Belarus. There are two uh, aims for those launchers. First of all, it is about the creation of so-called um, uh, anti-aircraft umbrella uh, to allow Russian troops, uh, Russian air forces to attack Ukrainian territory and prevent Ukrainian counterattacks. And secondly, as an option to launch missiles modernized to uh, surface to surface option from the territory of Belarus. That is why that threat th uh, still existed. Mm -hmm. Super. Well, thank you, Sidi. I think we're going to start wrapping up. I mean, just uh, very quickly, I mean, the presentation, will it be available for, yeah, for the, yes? So, okay. So then I'll ask, because um, we're getting a lot of gratitude in, in the, um, uh, from the members I'm getting in the chats and also on my, uh, my other uh, communication source. So very, very grateful. And I know the next um, session will be on March the 30th. That will be the physical security of protection of personnel facilities operation. But we do have one question that I just would like to raise very, very quickly. Um, question is, is it safe to use the Starlink antenna on a school building from a perspective to be targeted or considered as a military facility? You know, my answer is no, because we were considering also to share a Starlink uh, option for all of our staff who remain in Ukraine, and our IT colleagues said, no, please don't do that. First of all, because of it was a reasonable question, and I confirm, uh, confirm that, that uh, our response was uh, based on the same assumptions, that it may be recognized as a potential military target. Interesting, interesting. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, and then I think that that's pretty much it. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, please, you know, join me in uh, well, uh, well, in thanking Sirhi for an excellent presentation. Um, I think it's been extremely timely. It's been extremely detailed, and it's been extremely well researched. Um, thank you, and it's so important. And we do look forward to catching up in person very, very soon. Uh, but before we do that, I think the next presentation will be on Thursday, March 30th at 11 a.m. Kiev time about the physical uh, security in Ukraine. Um, and we do get a lot of questions from uh, our head offices in terms of when can they come to Ukraine, and many are coming to Ukraine. But um, on that note, uh, Sadhi, thank you very much for your, your service. Thank you very much for, for sharing your uh, expertise, knowledge and, and advice with our members. Uh, stay safe and uh, together to victory and uh, Slava Ukraini. Heroem Slava, uh, last comments. Uh, dear friends, uh, to make our next presentation more effective, I would like to uh, ask you to send me questions. What would be interesting for you just to make it like a Q&A session mostly because, you know, if we will immerse in details of uh, physical security, we will not we wouldn't be uh, so effective as we could be in case of like a practical questions to, to be responded. Brilliant. Thank we'll you. do that. So then, Olena, if we can get the questions um, in, maybe we can do a questionnaire. Uh, and um, so that we have, because I think the next section is going to be extremely, e e even more interesting because it's going to be very tangible, very practical advice on, on, on personal security. And uh, so on that note, stay safe. Uh, God bless and um, Slava Ukraini. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. See you. Bye.